Okay, we're now recording. Uh, welcome everyone to the monthly Open Tracing uh, Specification Council call. Uh, today we've got uh, two uh, presentations uh, that I'm excited about both of them. Um, and uh, to kick it off, uh, Johannes is going to talk to us about service maps. Uh, Johannes works for the Platform Lab uh, team at Envision. Um, he's been uh, working uh, on open tracing. He's also been playing with some light step. In the past, he worked at New Relic, so he's familiar with APMs and tracing in general. Uh, Johannes, good to, to see you virtually in person. Good to be here. Yeah. And uh, if you would like uh, to, if you have slides, uh, if you'd like to screen share and kind of take over. Um, yep. Great. Why don't you give us an introduction to what you're going to present? I know it's uh, service maps and it's something new, but you think it's, it's kind of a novel approach uh, to service map visualization. Yeah, I, I think so. So I'm, I would be excited to hear if someone has seen this before or not. Um, let me just get my uh, presentation up, share my screen. Um, how do you do that again? Let's see. Okay, can people see that? Yeah, looks good. Cool. Um, there we go. Okay. Yeah. So uh, my uh, little presentation is called "Service Maps with Open Tracing," um, and as Ted said, I'm I'm an engineer at the Platform Labs team, so we do kind of like various little tech uh, things, and this is just uh, like a very minor thing. So. Unfortunately, I haven't been able to spend too much time on it. So what you'll see here is more an idea than a, anything, like a full implementation of anything. Um, and, um, and yeah, so, so the problem that, that I'm trying to solve is uh, at Envision, we don't really have a service map, meaning like a graph showing the interdependencies between uh, microservices. We kind of have a ton of them already and a lot of people or no one has a full idea of all of them and how they're in interconnected. Uh, so there are uh, ways to build these and I'm gonna build one with open tracing. But one thing I, I have like two bonuses that I don't see too often and that's like, can we get a real time one? So if dependencies change or if there's some kind of like outage will the service map update can we can we get that um, and also normal service maps just say like this service is depending on this other service but it doesn't say um, like what what the channel is through all the microservices that makes that uh, one service uh, depend on another one via like a bunch of services so it'd be cool to get that um, let's see if I can move my. Um, so yeah, I, I've seen some tools out there, as mentioned, but uh, I, I don't think I know of anyone that uses open tracing. Although I wouldn't be surprised if that's the case. Uh, Anyway, that's, that's, that's what I used. Um, and one thing that was important for this project is that it's just like, for, for me even, it's just like maybe 5% of my time. Uh, and so I definitely can't go to other teams and say like, hey, why don't you just add this library and then we'll get service maps. Like I just need to be able to do this uh, without anyone's uh, involvement. Uh, and the good thing is that we had already instrumented most of our services with Lightstep, which as you know, is an open tracing provider. Um, and what I did 
was to create so uh, Lightstep you can configure to send HTTP drift messages uh, to the Lightstep satellite uh, which collects them and so what I've done is built uh, a proxy that proxies all the data uh, and also dumps it on Kafka. So for every thrift message, it proxies it and also creates the Kafka message. Um, yeah, so that's that's how I, I gather the data. Uh, and um, let's see. Yeah, so Lightstep is uh, proprietary. I mean, it's open source, but it's just one provider of open tracing. And so I guess this is when I'll make a little side point, uh, which is probably for this group, the most important point, uh, which is that I would love, love, love to have open tracing not only be the API, but also uh, the, the format, maybe the transport, so that like I said, we have instrumented everything with Lightstep, but it would be so sweet if I could just say, we have instrumented it with open tracing. So now we can plug in Lightstep or we can plug in this new thing that I'm making or whatever other open tracing uh, utility. I think that, yeah, that would be a huge change because right now, I mean, you probably already know this, you're probably already on top of this, but uh, right now, I really have to either make a proxy like this and decipher those messages, or I have to involve every team and say like, hey, use this new library in addition to what you're using. So yeah, I think it would make it easier to make one-off services like I'm making, uh, also to change providers or have, have multiple providers. And I think it would be a cool idea. Uh, and I, I'm interested if this is something uh, that you've already, that's already in the works. Um, cool, so, <clears throat> so now that I have this data, uh, I have a, a service um, that I'm actually running on my laptop. So instead of deploying a service and everything, I'm just running this little Kafka consumer on my computer, slurping in all the, spans uh, as they come in on Kafka and then aggregating them in memory. Uh, and this is probably how most open tracing uh, things work, uh, I assume. Um, uh, and so the kind of the first, to answer the first question that I posed in the beginning, which is just like which services talk to which services, um, I just count edges basically. So this service, and I'm looking at the component name, uh, which I'm not sure if that's Lightstep specific or open tracing, and then the operation name. Uh, actually, first of all, I'm just looking at uh, component name. So which service is it? Uh, and so you, I just map services talking to each other. Uh, and then, um, Using graph of this, I get uh, something like this. Sorry. I'm not sure you can see this thing on my screen, but it's blocking my view. Uh, yeah, we can see it. Okay, let me, let's see if I can remove it then. Sure. We can see your graph is. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. No, I just had a zoom window blocking it. Okay. Okay, so here you can see, this is just a subset of the services we have. <clears throat> and this is running in testing as well. I didn't, I wasn't quite ready to deploy my one-off service to production quite yet. Um, and so uh, here you can see like a little group of um, services that depend on each other. One thing that was uh, immediately came out of this for me was that we have this users API service and teams API service and they depend on each other. So I think that uh, sounds like that should be one service and not two services. Uh, and I, oh, it's always cool to look at visualizations to kind of get a different view and a different idea. Um, 
but yeah, one thing that's cool about this is that it also answers the, um, my first bonus question, which is that this, this kind of feeds off Kafka and could spit out the graph every five minutes or whatever. And so you can really get like a, an updated view. Uh, there's no need to like update some YAML dependency file or like figure it out manually. It just like feeds off of uh, open tracing data. Uh, I also build these uh, uh, kind of Markov chain um, graphs. And for anyone not familiar with Markov chains, it's basically saying like for each node, you can see arrows pointing out uh, with percentages. And that's like the likelihood that a call will go in that direction. Of course, it's, it's not really like a random uh, um, random choice here, it's, it's defined with the code, but, but if you just like uh, want an overview, you can see uh, where calls go. And I also put in like an enter and exit node to see uh, how it enters our system and how it leaves it. Um, and this spaghetti uh, is kind of when I, instead of just doing the component names, I also added, uh, the operation names, so you can see it's like Teams API, get user teams, or Teams API, get user uh, open enrollment teams. And so you can see within the service uh, how the data flows. Um, but this, the reason why I'm just showing you a little bit is that it, even for the small subset of data that I had, it very quickly becomes a little unreadable and you have to scroll around and it's, it's tough. Um, so, so that's like the first approach. Um, and what I uh, have been doing just a little bit, and um, which I think might be uh, more novel, at least I haven't seen it for service maps, uh, which is that instead of doing this kind of shallow map where you have, uh, sorry, where you have just like, um, you can see uh, the, the likelihood of where it goes out of the service, but you can't really see the path that it took to get there. Uh, so instead of counting edges, I'm counting these paths through the system. And so um, what I'm doing is basically looking at the tree of calls uh, and, and sorting it in a specific way just to uh, make a can canonical version of it. Um, and I think there are different ways where you can involve the tag names and stuff to get more interesting data. But so far I'm just doing component and operation name. Uh, and so I'm just counting. So for each like complete path that happens with, in my aggregation, I make a little hash of it and then I increment the counter. So um, just a side note is that this, like it's running on my laptop and it's running just fine on my laptop because I just need these like hash to integer mappings. It's not really a lot of data at all. And the output of this uh, thing is also tiny. I just need to like, for every canonicalized path, I need to store it and then store the count associated with it. Uh, feel free to interrupt me with questions, by the way. I, I realize that there's uh, a lot of talking text and not too much illustrations here. So if it's hard to follow, let me know. Um, yeah, so the idea with these paths is that you can answer uh, questions like, like what, what is the entry point to uh, all our services that ends up uh, with like a certain call to a service? Uh, like why are we getting so many of these? Like everyone calls them, but what's the or origin of these calls? Another thing that I think is interesting for something like Lightstep or other open tracing providers is that you can, if you have an outlier, say in, in response time, you, you can see like, okay, this thing takes 10 seconds. I think it's interesting to know, like how common is this path through the system? Because if it's completely uncommon and it's very slow, 
that means that this is a one-off thing that um, um, that you can like ignore or deal with depending on. Or if it's like very slow and super common, then you know that there's something about the data or your system at this point. So those are like very different things, and the count of the paths will tell you which group it belongs in. Um, yeah, I, oh, right, so I have some other graphs, which I think I need to switch to my browser. Let's see. Okay, can you, can you see this one? Yeah, okay, so, so this is uh, uh, one where we have, um, we have the component name and we also have the operation name. And so um, one thing you might wonder if you look at this, you, you see that there's like, we have a bunch of calls to this Teams API uh, get team. And so the question uh, is like, how, how did it get here? Because we can follow this arrow up. And so we know that it came from this user's API. Uh, which came from this one. This is just by following that the only arrows pointing in that direction. But here, like once we're here, we can't say like, did the calls that came through here, did they come from the Teams API or the conversation service or did they come through our system originally? So those are the three paths that could be taken to get into this. And so if we wanna reason about the paths of this, uh, in just the diagram view, we can't, we can't really see that. Uh, but with the paths, uh, I, can, I can generate those counts. So uh, now I've highlighted this. Uh, I, I had to do this very manually, uh, unfortunately. I think this would be way better interactively. But basically now we can see that there is zero calls coming through here. Uh, all of the calls from conversation service uh, we'll go through this path. Uh, I guess, yeah, I guess all of them will either go through the, here or come directly in from outside. Uh, so <clears throat> what I, yeah, so this is like a very early prototype of what I think as an interactive diagram could actually be very useful. Um, I have a quick question. Yeah. yeah. Um, have Have you done anything with having kind of breaking out those calls by um, any sort of metadata, like if an error occurred, or using any like the semantic conventions to you know, uh, kind of categorize what percentage of those calls are for this reason or that reason? I have not, but I think that's a really good question. And I think that's something where you could see a lot of uh, interesting data like that and tags and um, yeah. Uh, and yeah. And, and I think, so uh, I think if I built this service for real, then I think it would be interesting to uh, try to dynamically figure out like what are the big groups of things that make a difference here. And so you could break it down by those interesting things. Um, but yeah, so far I haven't done it. Uh, All right. Cool, thank you. Yeah. And yeah, so actually what, what I really wanted to build but uh, I didn't have time is um, Google Analytics have, has this really cool user flow diagram that's uh, a Sankey diagram if people are familiar with those. Uh, which is, I think, a great visualization for this. Unfortunately, uh, I didn't have time to to make that for this presentation. I also think uh, Netflix is a visceral. Uh, this is a screenshot from their thing. I think that could be a cool uh, way to vis visualize it. It's actually more like cool than useful because it's, again, one of those shallow uh, mappings. So it doesn't really tell you like the story of the path through the system. 
uh, but it does give you a very nice live view. So this would, these dots on the diagram would actually move if this was a, um, a live instance of it. Um, so, um, so yeah, that's, that's what I have. And I'm super interested again to hear if you have, any of you have seen this before or uh, there are products like this. Um, and yeah, that's what I got. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Johannes. Uh, um, I wanted to mention, uh, because you were discussing uh, standardized wire protocols and data format, uh, uh, that work, uh, we're not doing it directly in open tracing because that project right now is just trying to stick to the sort of language API level, but it is going on with many of the same people through the W3C. Oh, cool. uh, I'll post, just posted a link in the chat, the W3C trace context uh, working group. Uh, we actually just met uh, last week in uh, the uh, Lyon, France for the big W3C meeting. Um, that's got two parts. One part that's, that's nearly to a V1 is, is the wire protocol for in-band context propagation. So that's uh, what you would be injecting and extracting uh, from carriers and open tracing. Uh, so some standardized HTTP headers for including tracing metadata. Um, that works interesting also because it's focused not just on standardizing uh, for individual tracers, but for interop. So if you had a trace that actually went through several tracing systems, uh, the canonical example is uh, if you have a service provider uh, like an infrastructure provider and they have tracing data um, and then you have you know your own tracing system that you're running in your application uh, and you'd like to link that information together uh, so that you can you know say you've got uh, oh, I don't know you're running New Relic or LightStep in your app and then you're running on top of um, Microsoft Azure or Google Cloud and you're using one of their services, uh, they're not going to be running LightStep or New Relic on Spanner, but perhaps they could give you some kind of uh, interesting trace data out of Spanner or similar service. Um, so there's that going on. And more relevant to the service map uh, discussion you're doing, we're thinking about trying to standardize the sort of export format so that you could do black box tracing like this. So if you just had kind of a standard wire protocol for uh, trace data being propagated in band, and then some more standard way of being able to attach to a process and get some kind of standard export format or a push model like, like syslog, you know, um, something that everyone could consume uh, without having to know the particular kind of monitoring service that was running inside of the app. So I think that's something you would probably have liked to have had when you're running this experiment. Definitely. <laughs> that's super cool. Yeah. Um, I think this is interesting. I haven't seen, uh, I've certainly seen service maps, um, but I do like the idea of not just of, they tend to be service level, I think, and not, I like the idea of digging down into path history I can see this being interesting for outlier analysis. Um, and also uh, the percentages that you're showing, I can see that being very interesting. If you're just trying to figure out generally where's the traffic coming from, uh, kind of getting a sense of the various flows that are generating some particular, it seemed like you were finding some particular point of interest and then working back from that to see the, the various types of things that were causing it. Yeah, correct. Uh, I can uh, like share some experience with this. So we've implemented deep service maps uh, like a year or so ago. I actually showed them at the last KubeCon. Um, so one thing about that is that um, the the way you show them, it works fine if your architecture is small. Uh, as soon as you go to a large scale, uh, like at Uber, we have three something thousand services. 
So those those maps by themselves, like if you do the whole architecture, they become completely useless and unusable. Um, and so our service maps were instead done from the like point of view of a service developer. So you pick a service first, and then you visualize all the paths going through that service, uh, rather than like the whole architecture. Um, otherwise, it's just too huge. Um, and on on I'm I was like curious to see Sankey diagram. We've we've also experimented with a Sankey diagram, and we just couldn't make them work at any scale. Uh, I mean, they're, they're they're kind of interesting at if you have maybe ten services, but but anything more than that, and it just becomes um, unwieldy. Yeah, I I so I didn't have anything to show, but yeah, I definitely saw already with what I was trying that it, it becomes very uh, long, basically. Like if you show paths through it, it yeah. yeah. I, I think for the tiny tiny stuff that I had, maybe it would be possible, but. Uh, yeah. yeah. Well, well, the, actually, the graphs were, were very useful. I, we had a lot of people internally at Uber like uh, asking for them and uh, and using them to understand the dependencies. So, yeah. do you have a link to that talk, by the way? I'd be very interested to see it. Uh, yeah, I mean, at KubeCon, uh, they should have. I can I can post in the chat. Thank you. Um, Thank there you. was another talk from uh, Bill Westland who uh, also worked on that project that I linked. I don't have the link for the KubeCon talk, but there is. Okay, that one is even better because he actually showed live demo of that. I, I just got a screenshot. And it's the, it's the same thing? Yeah, yeah, this is, um, yeah. What Bill showed is, is like the live examples of that thing. Very cool, thank you. Yeah, it has like live filtering, like you mentioned with the highlighting the service and stuff like that, it's, it's really interesting. Yeah. But I can see your approach, Johannes. You don't necessarily need the whole service map. If you're starting from something you're interested in and then working backwards, uh, seeing a map of everything in your system isn't very relevant. You're specifically only interested in the things that led to that particular interesting moment. So, yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, that's we've. Um, that's probably one of the directions we're going to take with the next iteration of the dependency maps. Uh, kind of restricting it more severely because on larger, like some more popular or more relevant or I guess commonly used services, it becomes pretty difficult to use. So we're going to probably limit it to a single service being on all paths. So it's kind of a focal service and then like a number of hops up from that service and down from that service and then allow the user to kind of progressively expand or collapse. So. Sweet. Yeah, it's really interesting stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Any other uh, uh, final questions? Otherwise, we're going to switch gears to uh, Java agents. Great. That was an awesome presentation. Thank you so much, Johannes, for putting that together. Uh, uh, yeah, please let us know if you publish that work in any way. Will do. Thanks. Yeah. OK, so uh, next up, uh, we have uh, some fun work uh, we've been doing um, at Lightstep. Uh, Seva uh, Safras uh, lives in Thailand, and he's been working with us on uh, Java agent work. Uh, however, rather than a code of a black box agent approach, we've been trying to look at one that would leverage um, existing open tracing instrumentation. Uh, uh, sim somewhat similar to the existing Java agent that was in Contrib, uh, but thought we came up with uh, a kind of interesting way of actually putting it together. So Seva's on the call today, uh, and he's going to lead us through an overview of that project. It's just about getting to the point where it would be great for other people to kind of get involved. So this is sort of a, a welcome, welcome to Java special agent talk. All right. Do you guys hear me? Okay, uh, let me share my screen here. Uh, how do I do this? Okay. All right. So uh, hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Seva Safras, and I have been working on the special agent project. 
uh, with, with Ted. Uh, just to give you guys a jump start into the context of the project, uh, this project is essentially the Java agent, but more. So basically, um, it does everything that the agent does, uh, but it also does automatic instrumentation. So let's talk about what that means. Uh, all right, so first of all, motivation. What is the mo motivation behind the special agent? The essential motivations are to, with, with a single, with a single, um, with a single command effectively, uh, achieve end-to-end -end tracing to be able to instrument all RPC libraries, runtime frameworks in every service. Manual installation, configuration of plugins is significantly cost, uh, is a significant cost barrier. So the idea is to make it easy and efficient to, uh, to effectively instrument an entire application with, uh, with the uh, le least of effort. Since it's possible to automate the process of installing plugins, um, we basically are trying to create a tool that would do exactly that, automatically instrument the third party uh, libraries in, in, in an entire application. This would be helpful for large organizations, with big code bases and many services, and especially helpful for teams that do not have access to the, um, to the source code itself. All right, so high level goals. High level goals of this project were to allow any plugin in the Open Tracing Contrib project to be automatically installable in an application. Right, so essentially um, you, you, uh, with one command, you instrument an entire application that leverages all of the instrumentation plugins in the Open Tracing Contrib um, project. Install any, pl install any plugins regard regardless in which class loader the library is loaded. So this is a pretty big one uh, because as we all know, um, in Java, you never can be certain which class in which class loader any class is loaded. And to say more to this, you can never even be sure that the class loader is a regular class loader that even has a it has a class path, for instance. So number three must not destabilize the target application. So this is kind of a quality control uh, goal. Uh, provide a single line command to statically or dynamically attach to a target application ru running on JVM versions 1.7 to the latest. And also to provide a lightweight, test, lightweight testing methodology to test auto instrumentation. So this is effectively a testing tool that would allow a developer to easily test his Byteman script and ensure that the instrumentation plugin is being properly loaded and is resulting in, uh, in traces uh, uh, via, via, uh, via mod tracer. So the, the idea behind this, this, test, um, this test methodology is that it would simulate the exact conditions, the exact uh, toughest conditions that would have to be met by any application. And, and those would basically be uh, that, the, uh, that the classes that, that, that need to be instrumented are loaded in a class loader that is uh, disconnected from, from the system class loader. And, uh, and finally, to initialize the mock tracer and to provide a reference uh, 
to, uh, to, uh, an easy reference basically to, to the test methods. And lastly, um, is uh, so this this um, special agent needs to be configurable, and this is the the kind of uh, uh, still still out uh, in the uh, in the foreshadowing uh, uh, stages of, of the project. And by the way, if anybody has any questions, please uh, uh, feel free. Um, okay, so very high level arch ar architecture. The idea is that the special agent is built with all of the instrumentation packages inside of it. So that basically when you declare the Java agent parameter or Java agent uh, VM argument on the command line for an application when you're statically attaching, um, that jar has every instrumentation plugin inside of it which also then so so that's that's instrumentation packages uh the ota rules files are also um are also packaged inside of the special agent and they are correlated to the instrumentation packages uh so that, so that effectively uh it is known which uh which rule uh, is uh, is attached to which instrumentation package and so then when the special agent attaches to the application, it has all of the resources to be able to um, uh, trigger and instrument the, uh, the uh, third party libraries. Okay. Custom class loaders. So this little piece shows how the special agent deals with the situation where classes are loaded in class loaders that, well, are not the, the system class loader, basically. Because if it's not the system class, class loader, it could be really anything. Um, and so what is the farthest extreme of anything, of any weird class loader. In this picture, that will be custom class loader two. And custom class loader two is a class loader that is detached from the system class loader. Um, and and it, it is only attached to the boot class loader. Because, so boot, boot class loader is, uh, is a class loader that, that you cannot actually if effectively detach yourself from. So any class loader uh, that, that is ever uh, created, it is a, it, it, it does have an, a, like a super parent as the boot class loader. Um, but in this example, uh, the contrary is custom class loader one, which has a parent that is the system class loader that then is connected to the uh, boot class loader. Okay, so how does um, the special agent deal with this situation? The way the special agent operates is And I, so, okay, uh, I'll quick, quick overview here because it's on the next slide. Uh, so ByteMan, ByteMan gets injected into the boot class loader so that any code, any, any bytecode that references ByteMan from any class loader would be able to reference ByteMan because it exists in the boot class loader. Okay, right. And then, next slide. Oh wait, that's not where I wanted to go. Okay, weird. Okay, so, ByteMan. The way that the special agent is able to operates with custom class loaders is that it leverages it, it fully leverages the OTA rules.btm files. So what, what do these files represent? These files represent the trigger point into the third party library for instrumentation. That is to say that if the if this byteman rule gets triggered, then this library exists in the system. And from this 
points, we can extract some information. The first point that, uh, so number one uh, is uh, something that is done beforehand, uh, before the trigger event, and that is to associate the instrumentation package with each OTA rules.vtm file. So, so that basically links together the uh, implementation of the instrumentation plugin with the Byteman rules file. Okay, number two is when trigger happens, when, when Byteman triggers. When the rule triggers, the special agent uses the trigger, uses the object on which the rule was triggered to determine the, the target class loader. Okay, so now we know what class loader the, uh, uh, the, the class uh, for the object is loaded in. And then using some very interesting uh, patterns, um, the special agent loads bytecode of the instrumentation classes in the target class loader directly. And the way it does this is it actually uses Byteman itself to override the class loader dot find class method and also then exposes the define class method. So effectively what the code is doing is it is uh, forcing the class loader to be able to resolve any of the classes in the instrumentation plugin. And upon resolution, those, the, byte, the bytecode for those classes is directly injected into the class loader, okay? All right. See here. I don't know how this got messed up. Okay. So, so if anybody has any questions about the class loaders, um, feel free. I, it, I, I, I skipped a lot of complexity, but, uh, um, but that's basically the uh, the idea. And what's great about this is that the uh, this this solution effectively works for any class loader because it uh, operates with the uh, with 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 Java Lang class loader uh, um, class. Okay, so installation of uh, the special agent. So the special agent is a Maven project, and it has two artifacts that are built. It has the main artifact and it has the tests artifact. And effectively, these two artifacts, these two jars are the only jars that are necessary to use special agent, either for instrumentation or for testing of instrumentation plugins, okay? Um, so in this situation, uh, in this slide, the special agent, main jar, um, has all of the instrumentation plugins inside of it. And when it is passed to the Java, Ag uh, Java agent VM argument for static attach, uh, or when it is uh, run as a, as a main jar uh, with the PID of a process, it is able to effectively attach and instrument the full scope of all of the open tracing contrib um, uh, interpretation plugins. The special agent tests jar is intended for testing and it is basically the, um, the jar that contains within it uh, th this, this class called agent runner, right? So the agent runner is a J unit runner and this J unit runner is used to, um, it, it, it is, is used when, when constructing your, your test class uh, to, to be able to, to si simulate uh, the steps that I had described earlier. Um, 
basically, uh, yes, so uh, Agent Runner um, is effectively all that you need uh, for testing of, of, your, uh, of, your, of your plugin. It does not have any of the instrumentation plugins. Uh, this jar does not have any instru instrumentation plugins with, within it. And uh, it also supports the Java agent VM arguments and the standalone execution. Okay, let me... Okay, so this is the main usage of uh, the special agent. And effectively, it, it's just an example of how to use uh, with Java agent VMARG or the uh, dynamic attach to be able to attach to a running application at, uh, on, on the bottom here. Okay, so this is what I wanted to get to here. So test usage, and this is, uh, this is actually some, some pretty cool stuff here because um, effectively what the agent runner is able to do is it is able to simulate these very obtuse conditions with uh, a, a detached class loader um, and and allow a developer to test his uh, instrumentation plugin and OTA rules file with these conditions. Okay, so how do you how do you do that? Effectively, you just follow uh, regular JUnit patterns, vanilla JUnit patterns. You use the run with annotation. You create your test method with the test annotation. Um, you declare the mock tracer as a as a, as a parameter, and and that's it. And basically, when you run this, what happens is that the test method. It is well. First of all, the the test runtime is uh, is forked. Okay, because it has to be forked for the uh, for the Java agent to to, to bind prop, uh, to, to uh, effectively to statically bind, and then it elevates all of the code inside of the test method into a class loader that is detached from system class loader, and and that's it. And then whatever whatever OTA rules file that, that you have in, in, the, uh, in the class path and uh, wh whatever instrumentation classes that it points to, then, then it just do does its thing. And uh, uh, you have your reference to the tracer and you can check to see that, that uh, things are properly working. Uh, so effectively, this this pattern the the, the Java the, sorry the uh, agent runner um, it, it is effectively a uh, it supports full JUnit vanilla patterns um, and it runs in both uh, uh, the Surefire plugin as well as uh, IDEs um, and finally, how do you include this uh, this this test this uh, agent runner in your dependencies? Uh, this is it. It's basically the same dependency um, artifact descriptor as you would you you would use for a regular special agent, but you add the uh, test jar as the type, um, and and you're done. Um, so next steps. One of the more serious uh, hurdles that, that we're trying to get past is the fact that um, many instrumentation plugins use the inheritance pattern to instrument, um, to instrument third party classes, libraries. And this pattern, unfortunately, is very difficult to 
to uh, implement f with, uh, with triggering with ByteMan because ByteMan does not support uh, triggering off of uh, new. Um, so this is something that, that we're trying to, to still figure out. Um, number two here is to add OTA rules for all current Java instrumentation plugins. And finally, to support configuring uh, instrumentation. And uh, th th here's the link for all of you guys that I will paste into, into the, uh, the chat. Okay. Yeah. Any questions? So the, the main interest here, well, I, I think there's like two things I'm interested in. One is uh, support for different versions of Java, including new versions of Java. Um, and the other is, you know, the emphasis on, on, uh, on testing is due to the, the trickiness around writing these ByteMan rules file, rule files, basically. Um, yeah, I was just gonna say, um, I mean, it's, it looks like a big improvement on, on the testing from the current agent and, and also the class loading issue, um, if I understand it correctly, seems seems like you know it could solve a problem that was with the the current Java agent. Um, but I'm just wondering, uh, I mean, in terms of from a project perspective, um, I'm not sure it's a good idea having like the existing Java agent and this special agent. So I mean, do is it would it be better to collapse them into one project, or you know deprecate the existing one? When, when it handles this, you know, the instrumentation rules that the current one handles. Yeah. Because I, I that... would agree with that, Gary. I, we didn't want to touch the, uh, we, it, when we were experimenting and rewriting this, you know, um, it was different enough than the current agent that uh, we felt it would be better to kind of get farther along and then make a proposal uh, rather than kind of mutating that code base uh, in case other people were, were using it. Um, I'm not sure what the current usage for the current Java agent is, but yeah, I agree. If, if y'all think this is a, uh, an interesting approach and improvement upon the existing ones, then yeah, we should, uh, we should merge them. Yeah. I mean, I, th I think it's better at least to have some indication of what's going to happen. Um, I mean, the only thing is I had a look on the, um, the special agent sort of, um, read me. Um, and it was saying one of the non goals was um, supporting custom rules, um, which is something that the current agent does support. Um, it's just that, you know, if, you, if somebody's instrumenting their services, you know, currently with the, the other instrumentations in, in OTT Contrib, um, they can, you know, use those existing instrumentations, but they can also get hold of the tracer and add their own spans. So I don't think it's any different when you have you know, rules are automatically installing the instrumentations. I think so, users will still want to be able to, you know, add their own custom rules for their own logic. So if I can jump in really quick, um, the, the, the trick with a uh, special agent is to be able to, to um, dynamically inject the uh, classes of the instrumentation plugin directly into the class loader. Uh, right now, the way that it is designed, it requires these classes to, to be pre-packaged inside of the special agent, right? So this, this is not the way that Java agent operates. Um, Java agent requires the plugin to be just added to the class path of the uh, um, of the application for static attach. But if the custom rules are only instrumenting the application's own code, then it doesn't need any additional classes to be packaged in the agent. 
Well, the, it, the, the actual instrumentation implementation, right? The actual plugin. Yeah, Gary, I think what's, um, the reason why it was a non-goal for this project is not that that's not interesting, but it seems like there's a variety of, there's uh, being able to safely install um, uh, plugins that are targeting, you know, third party software, which has a lot of its own trickiness around making sure you're targeting the right version. For example, some of the interesting edge cases here are like, you know, you might have instrumentation for multiple versions of JDBC or something. They're slightly different. You want to make sure you're installing the right one. Uh, so safety is an important issue. And then when it comes to kind of um, dynamically instrumenting application code, it just seems like the techniques you might use for doing that are a bit different. And so uh, it seemed like you could use this for installing, uh, you know, pre-existing instrumentation for pre-existing libraries uh, and potentially be using different uh, additional techniques if you were looking to kind of uh, target your application code or do something dynamic there. Since there's like a couple different approaches people seem to potentially want for instrumenting their application code. Uh, one is something similar to these sort of writing Byteman rules uh, where you just don't want to modify the source code, but you do know ahead of time what you'd like to target. Um, and then there's sort of other approaches around, you know, while the application is running, just give me some insights around different things that it's doing. Um, so it just seemed like the approach to that would be like additional work you do on top of that. And potentially you might want them all a cart as well. Um, since, uh, the, well, I'm not sure if there's extra safety issues there, but it just seemed like things that could be done a la carte potentially. So that that's the only reason why we put that that um, sort of limited scope there. But but it could be wrong. It might be rather similar. So uh, Gary, actually, I totally get what you were saying. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, and actually, uh, this is already implemented in in the. Uh, in the test version, in the test, um, uh, in, in the agent runner, the way that the agent runner works is uh, it does not have any prepackaged um, plugins inside of it, but it is still able to do the uh, instrumentation with Byteman uh, executing the rules, but for the specific plugin that you are testing. And so effectively, this is exactly the use case that you're talking about, but not for, for testing. You're, you're talking about actually using it for uh, instrumenting that, an application with custom uh, OTA rules file. So it's, it's not far off at all. Uh, I, I, I mean, uh, I, I just feel like some code would have to be uh, moved into the main uh, in, from test to main, and, and, and that's it. Okay. Um, yeah, I mean, it's just, I think it'd be good to remove the, you know, as a non-goal, possibly just, just to make sure it doesn't sound misleading, that that's not intended as, you know, a potential future benefit. But, uh, yeah. Yeah. That's fair. Um, right now, the big blocker really is Byteman not supporting new, which, uh, um, Sounds like something they're interested in supporting. So I think a concrete next step is to work with, with that group uh, to see if we can get that over the finish line because that will extend the reach of this to include like most, uh, most of the plugins we're looking at in OT Contrib right now. So yeah, if you're interested in Java agents and Java instrumentation in this manner, uh, what I think is interesting about it though, is that your tracing system, there's APMs out there that do these kinds of things, but if you're using a tracing system with open tracing, uh, it doesn't necessarily need to be doing this style of stuff. So you can be taking Jaeger or something like that and then using this to install things on top of open tracing. And I don't know, I found that to be a little, a little novel compared to having the a, the tracer you were installing under open tracing also be doing a bunch of these things kind of behind the scenes, which is how a lot of existing APMs work. Um, so if you're interested in, in 
uh, playing around with uh, Byteman and dynamic code injection, uh, please check the project out. We're getting to that stage where it'd be fun to, to have users and other people playing with it. And on that note, uh, we're over time. It's uh, 9.35. Uh, if people have any uh, final questions on this, um, I suggest uh, maybe uh, going to Gitter, the open tracing uh, public channel, uh, and continuing the discussion there. Um, and uh, in the meantime, it's been uh, lovely seeing all of your faces, uh, and I'll see you all again next month. Yeah. And thank you thanks again for you Johannes for your service Mac talk. Yeah. Thanks, Johannes. Thanks, Eva. Yeah. Thank you, guys. Cheers. Cheers. Bye bye. Cool stuff.